Hello and thank you for joining me. I'm Heidi Adams and you are watching Straight Talk Africa. This week, we continue our coverage of the lives of refugees across Africa and the world. What are the most worrying hotspots and drivers of forced displacement on the continent? And what are host nations obligated to do for those seeking refuge in their country? We'll speak to the Africa Advocacy Director at Human Rights Watch. The states have a duty to protect refugees and asylum seekers under their jurisdiction, including from abuse by their own police um, and other state actors. Also, we'll bring you part two of Voice of America's new documentary film that takes an in-depth look at the lives and experiences of refugees around the world. All of that and more just ahead. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Across Africa, as in the rest of the world, forced displacement is often a long-term experience, and policies involving refugee rights and restrictions differ from country to country. The East African nation of Somalia regularly makes global headlines only for its problems. Terrorism, conflict, political and economic instability, the primary reasons why many have fled the country over decades. But some see Somalia in a different light. A number of Syrian refugees are rebuilding their lives there after fleeing war in their own country. And as Mohammed Sheikh reports from Mogadishu, Somali officials say Syrian refugees have helped enrich the African nation's culture and economy. Zakaria Azarkan is a Syrian refugee who fled civil war in his homeland two years ago to seek opportunities in Somalia, a country that is still recovering from internal conflict. Now, he is chef and manager of Alwarda Ashamia, a popular Syrian restaurant in Mogadishu. I expect other Syrians will find opportunities here and to open new projects, even though Somalia is still emerging from war. There are Syrian dentists who have opened clinics and even other doctors with various specialties who operate medical centers. Azarkani's restaurant serves as a meeting place for Mogadishu Syrian community. Recent arrivals to the city come here for orientation. 13-year-old Mohammed Musa and his family arrived in Mogadishu just a few days ago. They dine with Somali locals who are now accustomed to Syrian cuisine. I urge all Syrian immigrants or even Somalis to come to this restaurant because the food here is irresistible. It feels as if I am back home in my country. Dr. Mahmoud Saleh is among the Syrian refugee medical professionals offering their healing skills to a country that lost most of its skilled workers to civil war, poverty, and years of lawlessness. Saleh has been in Somalia for the past four years and has fully integrated with the local community. The dental surgeon runs one of the best equipped clinics in Mogadishu and is credited for performing safe, successful operations. Saleh says he has settled here with his family. I now consider myself a Somali citizen through the fact that I have been here for four years with my wife and children who are attending Somali schools. We are following the Somali life like other Somali citizens, and my family also considers themselves as Somali. Syrians who chose to find refuge in Somalia away from their war-torn country may have been driven by the good historical relations between the two countries. In their peace times, both countries shared similar political ideologies. Abdul Wahab Sheikh is a Somali scholar and an expert on international relations and culture. <laughs> There has been a long-standing relationship between the two nations that began during the military regime that ruled Somalia and the Ba'ath-led government in Syria. These strong bilateral relations remained, and after Syria became engulfed in civil war, some opted to come to Somalia, where there are no visa restrictions for Syrian citizens. 
There is no official data on the number of Syrian refugees living in Mogadishu, and not all are as successful as Azarkan and Saleh. What is clear is that many of these refugees are making a positive contribution to the local economy and culture. Mohamed Sheikh Noor for VOA News, Mogadishu, Somalia. So what do host nations gain by welcoming and protecting those who have had to flee their home countries? And do you know what your government's obligations are towards refugees and other forcibly displaced people? Earlier, I spoke to Karine Kaneza Nantulia about it. She's the Africa Advocacy Director at Human Rights Watch here in Washington. She began with some sobering context, pointing out what she says are the most worrying future hotspots for forced displacement across the continent. Some of the worrying hotspots, I would say, in terms of regions, Ethiopia, take Ethiopia, um, which now faces a full scale of humanitarian crisis with the fighting in Tigray and in some of the regions, including the Oromia region, plus an upsurge in locust, uh, 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 leaving hundreds of thousands at risk of famine. Take Mozambique. You have an escalating insurgency and brutal attacks in the northern, or in the northern province of Cabo Delgado, uh, and natural disasters in some of the central provinces, and we tend to forget that as well which has displaced over 800,000 uh, people internally. I would like to finish by adding another worrying context. Kenya has announced a plan to close two refugee camps, the Dadaab and Kakuma refugee camps by, by, I believe, 2022. And those camps host more than 400,000 Somali, South Sudanese, Congolese, and other refugees. Um, so now, that is a, that's another worrying trend uh, in the sense that these refugees will be left with no solution um, if no solution is found. Now, Karine, as you know, I come from South Africa where I have seen this and I have reported on the xenophobic undercurrent that rears its head there from time to time. And as we've seen it, it can end up in violence and even turn deadly. Do governments have a duty or a responsibility to educate and inform their own citizens about refugees and other forcibly displaced people who are in the country or who would potentially be seeking refuge there? In a nutshell, I would say, yes, I do. Governments do have an obligation. And, and let's start with the, their legal obligations, right? You have 46 African countries that are party to the, uh, to the African uh, OAU Refugee Convention. 49 out of the 54, 55, rather, uh, are party to the UN Refugee Convention, and 31 to the Kampala Convention on Internally Displaced People. Nearly all African countries, and that's important to remember, voted to adopt what is called the Global Compact on Refugees, which is, which is, which is a framework that was adopted in 2018 to strengthen uh, the protection uh, of refugees. So states do have a, a responsibility not only to uphold their commitments and legal obligations, but all towards protecting asylum seekers, refugees, and, and, um, uh, and internally displaced people. But they also have an obligation to, to raise awareness and to make their own citizens aware of these commitments and obligations, um, knowing that the more people are informed, the more they will be able to help government to better protect the rights of these displaced people who live within, you know, under their jurisdiction. Um, and in that way, once they form their population, the, the same population is less likely to discriminate and commit abuses against them. And that, you know, to your point, um, uh, the xenophobic attacks that we saw uh, in South Africa, for instance. And let me just say that a number of African countries, especially within the IGAD region, have demonstrated their support. This included to, for instance, help refugees integrate into communities through work, uh, facilitate their access to education. And we've seen some positive steps, for instance, in Chad and Djibouti, who have actually taken concrete steps to actually implement that global uh, compact. And Kareen, as we know, COVID-19 has only exacerbated the circumstances of displaced people. Now, in a time where vaccines are already scarce in 
some governments are struggling to vaccinate their own citizens. Where would refugees fit into this picture? Should they be eligible for equal access or in some cases priority access to vaccines? How do you think governments should approach this? How should this work? Um, that's a tricky question. But I think we, we, we wouldn't say, uh, at least at Human Rights Watch, we wouldn't say that refugees should get priority access to vaccines. Rather, host governments, countries, should not discriminate based on immigration status in their COVID-19 response strategies and vaccine distribution. Um, they do have a... Governments have a responsibility, you see, to protect the human rights of everyone on their territory and under their jurisdiction, regardless of their nationality and, and migration status. And this includes the right to health, right? All asylum seekers, refugees, migrants, regardless of their legal status, should have equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines and related care on par. And that should be on an equal basis with, you know, the, the remaining population and everyone uh, in the country. There are certain barriers, right, that um, uh, confront refugees when they're accessing COVID-19 vaccines. The distance to vaccination sites, governments which require identity documents to register, when you don't have, when they don't have those documents, online registration system that are often um, difficult to access to people who are lacking co computer literacy, um, the cost, you know, real or perceived, you know, cost, language, language barriers, lack of information, misinformation, you know, um, vac vaccine hesitancy. Government should address these obviously barriers, including by carrying out awareness raising uh, campaigns. So people can understand um, when they are eligible and how to access a vaccine. And also making vaccines logistically accessible to refugees and IDPs. Again, we've seen positive steps. It's important to note, to note that. For instance, Rwanda vaccinating refugees uh, and asylum seekers. Senegal and Cameroon um, allowing refugees to register in designated health facilities. Um, and then there was an, uh, an awareness uh, raising campaign in the DRC that reached almost one point, uh, I think more than 1.7 million people. So that was awesome. Now, Karin, for people watching who may be refugees or fall into other forcibly displaced groups, just so they can know too, what should host governments be prepared to do for refugees and forcibly displaced people in their countries? I mean, that's besides house and feed them. The first one is to uphold their rights to health, um, education, an adequate you know, standard of living, freedom of movement, and their dignity, generally speaking. Um, and this includes ensuring that children can access schooling and making COVID-19 vaccinations equitably available, as I said. Um, uh, Human Rights Watch uh, has urged governments not to implement, for instance, in, in encampment policies or impose movement, work or education restrictions on refugees, asylum seekers and, uh, and IDPs. Um, because this not only helps protect their basic right, but it can also enable them to more sustainably integrate um, and contribute to local economic growth and development. The second block is really about protecting them from violence, abuse, uh, discrimination, and forced returns. It has happened in, for instance, in Tanzania, where Tanzania forcibly returned Burundian refugees to Burundi, or even uh, returning Mozambican uh, to Mozambique, even when home country conditions are safe and conducive for return. The refugee, the asylum seeker, the migrant has to feel that he or she um, is able, is safe. The states have a duty to protect refugees and asylum seekers under their jurisdiction, including from abuse by their own police um, and other state actors. Because in more, in more cases, in many cases, when you when you hear about the, the different experiences and accounts from refugees and asylum seekers on a daily basis, they they will tell you that they feel discriminated by state actors as well. Um, uh, being forced, for instance, to um, uh, uh, to be held for my for immigration purposes, that should not that should not be the case. Ultimately, where where Africa is heading is actually 
when we look at the AU Agenda 2063, when they talk about the, Af the Continental uh, Africa Free Trade uh, Agreement, which is meant to basically um, a, a boost, you know, intra intrastate trade and and uh, and the, the, the economies of all these uh, uh, 55 countries. That means that they have to do better by the refugee community. Again, linking that to the fact that refugees will, you know, uh, once once they are better protected, will actually boost the local economies. The refugee, the IDPs are are actually an important booster factor in how Africa is uh, envisioning, planning, and implementing its prosperity uh, plan. And that was Kareen Kaneza Nantulia there. She's the Africa Advocacy Director for Human Rights Watch, speaking to me here in Washington. Now, we asked you to weigh in on the subject on social media. Here's the question we asked. What do you think governments in Africa and around the world should do for refugees and other forcibly displaced people in their countries? Catherine Nakegude believes it comes down to governance and says African countries must change the way they govern. Democracy is needed with respect to its constitution. Nicholas Opolot in Uganda says existing problems must be solved in the refugees' country of origin instead of governments offering support to countries they have fled to. Well, Godfrey Olanya in Lesotho says governments should take responsibility for feeding, sheltering, internally displaced people in their countries and international communities should withhold aid if they fail to do so. And Pukenya Lukanika in Uganda says governments in Africa and around the world must treat refugees as human beings. Now, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Keep sharing your comments. Our producers are always working to select some of them so I can read them to you on air. Your views and opinions are always a very vital part of the show. So thank you very much. Still ahead here on Straight Talk Africa. We'll bring you part two of The Voice of America's new documentary, A Day in the Life of Refugees. We'll be back after a short break. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Welcome back to Straight Talk Africa. Last week, we brought you the first installment of a new documentary film produced by The Voice of America. In 2019, VOA sent more than 75 photojournalists around the world to document the stories and experiences of those who have had to flee their home countries to escape conflict, poverty and persecution. Here now is part two of A Day in the Life of Refugees. Some media do mark World Refugee Day. Another 70 million people have been forced from their homes because of persecution, rights abuses, conflict and violence. The current number of displaced people worldwide roughly equals the population of France. Most people who are forced to leave their homes hope to come back. Even those who have spent much of their lives in a refugee camp. Spain uh, is rather sensitive to the high number of refugees. The world's displaced population, which includes refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced people, has doubled in 20 years. Around half of the refugee population were children. And deportation proceedings are underway for 35 people police call illegal migrants from Myanmar. They were arrested overnight on the border with Thailand. The Rohingya Muslims are fleeing what the United Nations calls ethnic cleansing. Police found them waiting to be smuggled across the border into Malaysia. One smuggler is also arrested. The music the Frontex Maritime Police are playing was, in fact, 
written by the son of a refugee. So music is a very important part of the, the hours we are here, okay? The refugee day, it's important because it's a worldwide problem. Countries that don't go through those problems think that it's not their problem, but it actually is because it's everyone's problem. Every night is almost the same if we don't have any, any events, okay? So we go to the area of responsibility. Uh, we go, we try to cover it back and forth. We stop the boat sometimes a little bit, keep communications with the TVV. As quiet as it is on the water, it is equally quiet on the hill overlooking the strait. It's now six in the morning. It was a quiet night. Uh, no boat passed to here. Everything is great. As they said, that's good for both sides. Their patrol resumes tonight. Thirteen thousand Kurdish refugees from Syria live here. Kampaji zeda kahraba etna, yani kahraba kampay chicken, o avji kema. Asti majabi medirim tejara hatin kashuf kiri. Amin afoshan biyaki. Ibi koni zmerale ke na zvi xtiari te dana afoshan chilati hatta xlas bi abne elum sir mada, sir mati, qalanti, qashati. Zmerale che na kun tishte ki zmerale na. مدرسه‌مان گلکی نباشه. جبولم تقوازن هه هه بچه کدیجی ما به علم درس درسی و بچه کی صعب ان تقوازن بچه کی سهل بود. Their complaints don't consider that here they are safer than they were in Syria. As World Refugee Day continues. The head of the Bangladesh Refugee Resettlement Agency is at his next event, a friendly football match between Rohingya refugees and the surrounding community. <laughs> Not all have shoes. For the refugees, it's a well-appreciated diversion with awards from an important man. Ayub is getting ready to slip out of the camp where he and other refugees are being held. There's no way to get word to his family in Afghanistan right now. He left behind three sisters, four brothers, and his mother and father. So, who is this? My father and this is my small brother. It's been 12 days since he last made contact, and he says there's a lot of crying when they do connect. He's starting a risky journey. This is my friend, and they train cut his legs. You can see here. There. For him, the risk is worth it. Just 200 kilometers east, another Afghan refugee is doing well. When you start the journey, you don't know what is the ending, what is waiting for you on the other side. I just wanted a place that is warm and I have food and that's I don't want anymore, nothing much. He spends his days at a refugee center where he has learned English. He thought he could pass through to Hungary and get to Germany, but the border closed and it's been more than two and a half years. He stays in touch with home by watching VOA news from Afghanistan. Serbia is welcoming. Filippo Grandi likes to hear refugee success stories. Nice to you. 
The UN High Commissioner for Refugees is collecting his thoughts while a TV interview crew sets up. Camera roll. Camera. You ready? Success stories are rare in his business, even on World Refugee Day. Excellent. Good. I wanted two things when I was young. I wanted to do something useful. I did not know what useful meant, but I realized that there was out there a world that was much more turbulent, and I wanted to do something useful for people that were affected by that turbulence. And second, I wanted to travel. I wanted to see other places. After being in the refugee business for more than 30 years, he got his wishes. Are you afraid that the problem has gotten to the point where it's too large to fix, really? No, I refuse to entertain this narrative. And I think this is the danger. We are in a world in which we have a lot of unscrupulous politicians that are telling us exactly that, that it is impossible to stop this crisis of forced displacement. And you know what their solutions are? Push back, shut down, have restrictive legislation, build walls. That is a narrative that I don't accept. But more than 70 million people are displaced now around the world, and these numbers are, are rising. So whose failure is this? Most of the people that we're talking about, these 70 million, are fleeing from war, violence, um, crisis. And uh, the international community has seems to have lost its ability to address and resolve these wars and this crisis, even on the most um, clear, straightforward humanitarian situations, like in Yemen, like in Syria, even more so a few years ago, uh, and in other places, that unity that needs to be um, established by the various actors in, in the international community, by the various states, to solve problems is lost. The Security Council is always divided. And the Security Council is the supreme institution for peace and security in the world. So if that doesn't happen, this figure, which is now almost 71 million, unfortunately, next year will be higher again. Hi, Commissioner Filippo Grandi. Thank you so much for your time today in Jordan. Leyluma's husband is finally calling from Turkey. But he has bad news again. He says he does not have money to obtain a passport and a visa to return to Afghanistan. There are no simple answers. Getting to him by phone is easy. Getting him home is tough. Back from dropping his daughter at school, Eli Shiati keeps the history and heritage of the Uyghur people alive. One million Muslim Uyghurs are in Chinese re-education camps. He fled to Malaysia and made it to the United States. Now he tells the story of the repression of his people by China. There aren't many Uyghurs here, and he sometimes feels disconnected. Uh, 
看这边的书架了。It's a big responsibility. Meantime, more than 9,200 kilometers east, refugees who fled from nearby Burundi are performing at their camp's celebration of World Refugee Day. These refugees survived, but many are still missing. There is a World Refugee Day celebration of sorts underway at this refugee camp in Somalia. The kids get treats. The adults are seen as a resettlement success story. It's been four years since they fled Yemen by boat. With fighting continuing in Yemen, being here is worth smiling about. Today, this Syrian refugee is on her way to the hospital where her third child will be born. The arrival of the newborn will be bittersweet. Well, I had the land, I was an ayan, it's on a service name, my friends talk about. I was an ayan, it's on a service name, Nafsa Wada. Yan, it's on a service name, Lahalla, and a legit in service name. Listen, I was a yan. It's a boy. Born in Jordan, he will not be a citizen. He will grow up as a refugee. He now shares a birthday with World Refugee Day. Growing up, unless something changes, he will learn from his mother that to be a refugee is to be an outsider. On the road from Cox's Bazaar to the refugee camp, a flat tire makes getting back to the camp more difficult for Omar and his family. Fortunately, the driver has a spare and can fix it. The day is getting late. Unable to get the medical care he needs, Omar is worn out, and the rented car pulls up just before the curfew. In the best of times, it would be tough to live with this condition. In a refugee camp, nearly impossible. Across the Atlantic, in Washington, D.C. Welcome to Border Crossings. We have a very special program. The Voice of America's flagship music show today hosts a refugee from the Democratic Republic of Congo. We'd like to welcome to our studios and to Washington, D.C., an artist who gained acclaim by appearing on a very popular TV show in the United States called American Idol. The one and only Ron Tongues. it's nice to have you in our studios, Ron. He ended up in the U.S., a trauma of its own. When I came to, this, to the States, first off, I was just like silent mode because I'd never seen so many white folks before. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And you didn't um, speak the language. I didn't speak the language. <laughs> there was so much to soak up. What this has all taught me, the good and bad, is just how to love. This whole process has taught me how to learn to love people. Mm -hmm. He's still a struggling musician, but with a fan club and a website and a chance to sing his songs on the radio, he is on his way. We have just found one of the ships that rescue refugees from the dangers of these deceptively calm waters. But they don't want to see us, even on World Refugee Day. They heard below deck 
53 African migrants they just rescued. Some European governments say these ships are in league with the human traffickers each migrant has paid. Many of these ships have been impounded and their crews dispersed when they dock. Even on World Refugee Day, they turn us away. Back on Lampedusa, other refugees have just turned up. They arrived in small boats. Now in police custody, they are headed for the reception center for detention. It's uncertain whether this group will be held while seeking asylum, transferred to detention camps on the mainland, or be sent back. But even though they don't know where they are going, they sense it is better than where they've been. Ayub is ready. It's time for him to sneak away from the detention camp. He takes nothing to call attention to himself and heads towards a familiar route to both refugees and locals. He expects to be shaken down. And then maybe they're coming from center, they have home in center because they're coming and stopping people here and they take all his money and mobile and everything. And do they have some weapons? Yes, knife. This, play a lot of this was where some of the ambushes happened. Just walking, I will show you his place because it's very really dangerous. The town of Bihach is in view just beyond the hill. Some refugees get extra supplies there and come back to camp. Ayub is different. He wants out. Do you still think you will be catched? I think. I don't think, but uh, I think they will catch us in near of center. Here, maybe until one, two kilometers more, no problem. And we will, if we and you be in, coming in the near of center, they will, maybe they will catch me. In town, his plan is to disappear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck with so your much. trip. Thank you so much, sir. You. Bye. Good. Good the game is on again. Pick on, okay, thank you. It is midday on the west coast of the U.S. When he first arrived in Los Angeles, he went to the Jewish Family Services Food Bank for his meals. Can I get this order, please? Today, it's his day to volunteer at its kitchen. I got food for eight months till we found job. And now that we found jobs, I am working. My wife has a decent job. I am volunteering with the same organization to pack food for those people who can't afford it. And it feels very well and it keeps me connected to all the refugees and those who are in need. It's not because of World Refugee Day. It's just something he does. And it puts him in the right spirit for his audition tonight. Faraki Weldai fled Eritrean violence to safety in the Tigray region of Ethiopia. Today, he's at Aksum University in training to become a nurse. He's optimistic about his future and says leaving home was the right choice.
no word from immigration, so Yamis takes her sister for a walk. My name is... Who is My name is... In Mexico, they stand out. The people are welcoming, and she's a regular customer. She doesn't seem worried about how long they'll be here or what comes next. But she does have dreams. She likes the feel of our camera. Her Spanish is good, and she has a big personality. If not in the U.S., maybe she has a future in photography in Mexico. There is no doctor in this part of the sprawling Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya. So the local pharmacist fills in. With more than a quarter million refugees here, there is plenty of need. Himself a refugee, he's proud to help. On another side of the camp, Nia Mooch hopes World Refugee Day brings a sale. She has big dreams for her art. So as much as I have the talent and I might have the materials, market initiative. That is, unless you count selling to others in the refugee camp. This Syrian refugee is exhibiting today in an art show. He cuts up refugee tents and paints on them, a marketing angle that impresses art collectors. He takes to Facebook on World Refugee Day, then heads to an event with Italy's police academy. Italy's Deputy Prime Minister and Interior Minister, Matteo Salvini, has built his career and a substantial following by trying to close Italian ports to refugee ships and making it easier to deport refugees and migrants. Salvini says immigration without limits will bankrupt his country. On World Refugee Day, however, his focus is lowering taxes to grow Italy's economy. Opere pubbliche e taglio delle tasse. Altre ricette non ce ne sono. Meeting with government ministers, he talks about making life better for Italians. Like populist leaders in other countries, his initiatives resonate with citizens who believe that politicians are too quick to share scarce resources with newcomers that they would say have no right to be here. In Calais, we made it back from the jungle in time for the migrants press conference. As I am from Sudan, I have been witness a lot. They complain about their treatment by French police who they say unfairly harassed them. There was unfair fights. The event is put on by the migrants themselves. No other news cameras are there. As the sun sets, many in the camp are still outside. But inside his makeshift home, Omar perks up at the sound of a new toy. His parents are quiet. The thought of life-saving surgery is one of the many uncertainties ahead for these refugees. <laughs> Another uncertainty is their status. Even if Omar's condition is cured, with Myanmar still discriminating against Rohingya, he is likely to remain a refugee here. We are in a little bit of a rush because a little, a little one here 
Um, we couldn't find him. <laughs> I think he was just having fun with his friends. And we're trying to catch right now the six o'clock bus. It is unclear if Juan Antonio realizes what it is taking to get him to the bus on time, or even if he's grateful. Learning English is something he'll do later. Back in Colombia, it is night. The Venezuela refugees move to the plaza where they compete with rival dance groups from Colombia for serious money from tourists. This night, not a lot of money. But he says that's not the only reason he does it. There are always competitors, and this is something you do only when you are young and healthy. If injured, what does the future hold for a refugee? <laughs> At nighttime in California, Jay auditions for a job as a narrator. It's just beginning again at the international dateline and around the world at the dawn of a new day. For the test, he uses lines he performed in a play a year earlier. It quotes the English playwright William Shakespeare, who lived 400 years ago. Jay uses lines written back then that he says are appropriate on World Refugee Day. You'll put down strangers. Kill them. Cut their throats. Possess their houses. Whither would you go? Mounds on a parched hillside. This refugee camp, Kakuma, is one of the world's oldest in continuous operation since 1992. This is its cemetery. Babies born here are likely to die here. On World Refugee Day, there are no visitors and no signs of who these refugees were or what they had hoped to become. Juan has made it to the bus station just in time. Back at Casa Alitas, a migrant from Guatemala takes his place. Porque trataron de, este, o sea, de secuestrarme a la niña y pues no quiero que me la quiten, es única, única que tengo. I see very brave people. I see people who are showing us an example of how you should live. That if you know that there's something you can do to protect your family better, that you will do it. Significa algo muy especial, mi hija es único único motivo para seguir viviendo y pues no quiero que le pase nada malo. For most refugees, migrants and displaced people, their lives today were much like yesterday and will likely be the same tomorrow. What also will continue, the belief of the people we met that they can successfully make it to safety no matter what the odds. I still remember leaving the border through the Congo River. It was just, just a day that not only, as I got older, I realized that it actually kind of traumatized me. It was like the best and most traumatizing day of my life at the same time. Because had that day not happened and things not worked out, there's no telling, you know, how life could have rolled out for me. Entonces ese es mi propósito, digo, si ya Dios me tiene hasta acá, pues cumplir mis sueños y ayudar a casarle adelante con mi familia. They understand what it 
what you have to do to sacrifice everything for your family or to come ahead to this country and try to be able to put some money together and send it back to the people who remain. It's difficult always to be uprooted. And you go to a different country, it doesn't matter if it's heaven or not, but it's not your country. No, I don't want to go through again this refugee life. Este, lo que quiero es tratar de proteger a mi hija y pues yo pienso que acá vamos a estar mejor. At the end of this World Refugee Day, there are happy endings for some. Fadia and Montasser, husband and wife from Iraq, are minutes away from being sworn in as U.S. citizens in a ceremony in Portland, Oregon. But first, the presiding official must wrestle with proper pronunciation. That's, that's right. Yes. She rolls her eyes. Here in the northwest part of the United States, there aren't a lot of people from there. The ceremony starts with the American National Anthem. For them and the others, the words are still a little unfamiliar. If you will please raise your right hands. But, but I love my country. It's Iraq, and I love my country. Second country is America. So, so I I know it's not easy to leave my, my family. I mean, it's not. It's a big change. Big, it's new people, new country. It's um, new life, new food, big change. But I'm happy for my kids to give them a good future. Ultimately, World Refugee Day is ceremonial. It is one of many days on official calendars put out by organizations devoted to issues that, all too often, are in the shadows. Today, it recognized 70 million men, women, and children who have fled their homes in search of another, some out of fear and some in search of something better. But at the stroke of midnight, World Refugee Day ends. And refugees return to the shadows once more. Find a way to 
fill up these hearts and I know things will change not how much I love you how I have felt from the start I'm just learning to love through the good and the bad learning to love through the right and the wrong turning to love you drives me insane but I wouldn't want it Randall Tonga. And that is our show for this week. Be sure to follow us on social media where we will continue to cover major African news and developments throughout the week. And you can find Straight Talk Africa on Facebook and Twitter. And as always, you can share your comments with us there. Thank you for always watching and always listening. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>